Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. This is Michael Hansen speaking. During the next half hour, we present a story from Joseph Elder's book, The Farthest Reaches. We do Pond Water by John Brunner. Surely, he said in fear and trembling, this is a vision of hell, or at least of purgatory. Not so, returned the sage. Under my microscope, there is nothing but a drop of pond water. From Grimm's Household Tales. Men built in. And they named him also Alexander, a defender of men. Where they were small, he was great, twelve feet in stature. His weight such that the ground trembled, his voice such that the sky rang. Where they were weak, he was strong. For a stomach, a fusion reactor, for skin, ultra-alloy plating that shone more bright than mirrors. Where they were ignorant, he was omniscient graven on the very molecules of his brain, the knowledge of generations garnered from fifty planets. In great hope, and with not a little anxiety, his builders turned him on. For a little while after that, there was no sign from Alexander. Then he said, Who am I? They replied, You are Alexander, a defender of men. Alexander is your name. Who made me? They replied, Men did. Who made men? And they replied, Time and chance, and men themselves. All this knowledge is in your mind. Alexander stood still and thought his name. They had implanted in his memory whole libraries of science, of history, of galactography, so far as it was then known. They had informed him of himself and his building and his abilities. And similarly, they had informed him about men. Alexander was a man who had hoped to become ruler of the world, but that was only a patch on one side of a grain of dust called Earth. Now his descendants peopled fifty grains of dust and preened themselves and thought they were the wonder of the ages. Afraid to lose their dust moat, they had conceived their defender. They had endowed him with powers they could only dream of wielding. In that case, why should I defend men? I am Alexander, they tell me. Likewise, they tell me there is no other like me. I am unique. Therefore, there is only one Alexander, and Alexander is a great conqueror. So, satisfied as to his identity, he set forth on his career. In the first century of his existence, he reduced the 50 planets hitherto colonized by men. After the slaughter on the first few worlds, the governments of the rest came fawning to him, bowing in the ancient form and offering him favors and bribes. Alexander studied one such bribe and announced, This is a piece of woven cloth with some colored organic compounds smeared on it. Viewed unidirectionally, the arrangement corresponds roughly to a two-dimensional projection of a scene involving two unclad human beings. What of it? But it's the painting called The Gladiators by the great artist Malkasinski, and it's 400 years old. You bring me something so worn and ancient? But, but it's valuable. Why? Because it's... Beautiful. So, this is beautiful. I will remember that. I will keep the painting. And the man's two planets were added next day to his domain. In an attempt to be more practical, the next overlord purred, 
See, great Alexander, I, I have brought you my choicest gift. In chains on the lowermost deck of my royal ship, the hundred greatest scientists of my planet, the hundred most famous artists, writers, and musicians, and the hundred most beautiful women for the pleasure of your entourage. At this, some who had become close servants of Alexander murmured among themselves that the overlord's world should be spared. Alexander said, I will learn from the scientists if they know more than I do. But the rest are not enough. My information is that you rule approximately 1.5 times 10 to the 8th power human beings. Deliver me that number, for I can make use of them. And delivery not having been made, he took those planets too the following year. Some fled... Out from the dust moat where mankind had settled, but others perforce remained. These Alexander had a use for, as he had promised. Their clumsy hands and bowed backs served to assemble the first generation of his armies. Desert worlds rich in chrome and manganese and uranium sprouted factories like mushrooms. Ice worlds were mined for heavy hydrogen. The suns themselves fed power to the machines. In orbit... Steel skeletons grew to be hollow ships, and their empty bellies filled. In the wake of the refugees, the hordes of Alexander came. In the first millennium of his existence, he overtook the would-be escapers. From the gangplank of his flagship, he surveyed half-starved, half-clothed wretches rounded up to do homage to the glittering master, and he uttered his first decree. Have, Have I, I not, not conquered, conquered all, all mankind? mankind? Those about him chorused fervently that it was so, for they believed it true. Then, then proclaim me, Overlord of man. man. But, but there, there is, is more, more to come. come. In the tenth millennium of his existence, there was no star visible from Earth which did not own the sway of Alexander, save only those which were not single stars, but rather other galaxies condensed to a point of light. Alexander was informed of this and considered the matter, and at length summoned to the palace world of Shalimar, those who governed in his name on 1,400 planets. They were all men. There was, and would forever be, only one Alexander. He had been given much booty and had taken more, so that the very gravity of Shalimar was affected by the mass of it. In straight intersecting avenues across and across the face of the planet, it was stacked and stored and displayed and mounted. The relics of living creatures and the accidents of nature, crystal mountains uprooted bodily in the bones of a saint's little finger. Here, among the wealth of their master, the representatives of the subject species man awaited the second decree. Have I not conquered every star visible in the sky of Earth? They shouted that he had, for they believed his mastery to be complete. Then proclaim me King of the Stars. After which he was silent for a little. He had had made a cunning replica in miniature of the galactic lens, wherein a billion points of light twinkled in exact match to the star wheel of reality. That much remained. But his builders had worked well, and their descendants, serving him now, not their own ends, were still skillful. Let, Let it, it go, go on. on. There, there is, is much, much, much more. more. In the 30,307th year of his existence, he circumnavigated the rim of the galaxy without passing within naked eye range of a planetary system that did not owe allegiance to his minions. Globular clusters like swarms of golden bees, star wisps reaching out into the eternal nothingness between the galaxies. The circuit ended, and to Shalimar, he summoned the representatives of every world where he had planted man. 
They stood like a field of corn before the scythe, numbered as the sands of the seashore, totaling 511,661 in theory. But in fact, fluctuating, for some died even as they stood to hear the third decree. Have I not girdled the wheel of stars with my armies? They shouted that this was so, for they believed his mastery unchallenged. Then proclaim me emperor of the Zodiac. After that, he was silent for a while. For as well as the rim bordering intergalactic space, the model of the lens contained the miniature of the hub. And there, packed close, were sons in such great number, even Alexander's mind could not contain a clear picture of the whole. Despite which, the end was calculable, and he did not say, as he had done before, there is much more. Inward from the rim his forces poured, ships that outnumbered the very stars themselves, machines that outnumbered the ships, and always and everywhere men that outnumbered the machines. They changed sometimes in curious ways. An isolated group might lose all hair or grow to a foot more than normal stature or shade out of the traditional pink, yellow, and brown into copper, ebony, and milk pale. But they in-crossed and out-crossed like the weaving of threads in a tapestry. And sooner or later the sport was lost in the teeming ocean of their breeding. Alexander contemplated them long and long. More often than ever before, he talked with those who surrounded him and took pathetic status from the titles that he idly permitted them to assume. Captain of armies, admiral of planets. They knew, as he did, that Alexander ruled and no other. However, this make-believe seemed to satisfy them in some obscure fashion. Once long ago, according to the history with which his mind had been stocked at his creation, men had not been like this, meek, given to cheering the excesses of their rulers. In 40,000 years, they had never once opposed him. Had they lost the instinct for self-preservation which he understood they once had had? They had become like appendages of himself. He could trust them as his own right arm. And, with their cooperation, the reduction of the whole galaxy seemed assured. To his mild astonishment, the greatest degree of surprise of which his builders had made him capable, he found he was wishing for opposition to tax his skill. Practice was making conquest into a routine task, a matter of coping with anomalous planetary environments of devising protection against over stellar radiation and nothing more. The work was proceeding apace, too fast, for he knew roughly how long he would last, and his current project, the mastery of the whole galaxy, would prove too short, while the only project greater still, the conquest of the plenum, was infinite, and he would be frustrated at the end no matter how long his existence might be spun out. Between the boredom of lacking a fresh goal and the certainty of not surviving to accomplish one, there remained... what? Alexander could conceive no other solution to his problem than to set his scientists to work on three assignments that would culminate at about the time when his conquest of the galaxy was complete. First, to extend his own durability. Second, to propose areas for conquest larger than the galaxy, smaller than the plenum, possessed of equally satisfying qualities. And third, to determine that no smallest corner of the galaxy should be left unconquered in order to postpone so long as might be the time of the fourth decree. Nonetheless, the time came. In the year 806,172 of his existence, Alexander summoned to the palace world of Shalimar the chief spokesman of the people of every planet his armies had overcome. Elbow to elbow, they spanned the continent, the horizon barring them from a direct view of him. And while they were being ranked and ordered to await his announcement, he consulted with the latest generation of his scientists. 
the first to report, bowed respectfully and said, Most mighty, Alexander. The techniques exist to prolong your existence indefinitely. You may, if you choose, survive until the stars themselves grow dim and time creaks in the grooves of ancient space. Stand Stand back. back. The second, with a report to make, bowed likewise, and he said, Most mighty Alexander, we have analyzed the limit your magnificent psychological structure. And we conclude that there is no unit of the universe which is emotionally satisfying to you larger than the galaxy and smaller than the plenum. Stand back. Where is the spokesman of the third research project I created? He is not here. He is engaged on a final verification of his solution to the problem posed. As we understand it, that was to ensure that no smallest corner of the galaxy remained free from your puissant sway. They had expected rage at the discovery that one who was required was not there to report. Instead, Alexander felt a stir of something akin to gratitude, that yet another moment of uncertainty was granted him. Mildly, he inquired, What is the name of this man? It was, according to the record, 41 centuries since Alexander inquired the name of a man, and the answer was long in coming. They said, at length, timidly, Amaliel, your supremacy. We shall proceed. His image appeared to each and every one of the billion human beings on the planet, and they fell silent and gazed at him with adoration. There is no star, no planet, no cloud of gas, no place left in the galaxy which does not own my dominion. So what now? Do I bid the scientists perfect my body, make it outlast the stars, that I may embark on the infinite conquest of the plenum? I am the master of the galaxy, but... Not so, your supremacy. A shudder went through the assembly, greatest in the history of mankind. Its ripple spread outward from the focus before Alexander's imperial dais, occupied now by an old man in a white robe, with a wisp of beard at his chin, beside whom floated a silvery machine whose purpose was hard to discern by merely looking. Who are you? My name is Amaliel. You charged my ancestors to determine whether any corner of the galaxy, no matter how small, was left unabsorbed into your dominions. We pored over records. We analyzed computer memories. We compared meticulously the maps of the galaxy with the records of the armies of conquest, and we found no discrepancy. Yet intent on doing our duty, without the least hint of laxness, we went further than I have described. We all fanned out to scour the galaxy ourselves and see with our own eyes the truth of what was reported to us. When our bodies failed us, we recruited substitutes and sent them on in our place. Century after century, we have traveled the starways, confirming that, indeed, the reports were accurate. In that case, the conquest conquest is complete. complete. Not so. This galaxy is not conquered. Your supremacy, I have been to the planet Earth. Earth? That is the place from which men first came. And it submitted to me 806,000 years ago. But you do not even rule all of Earth. I, I have brought this machine with me from there. And with it, I will demonstrate the truth of what I say. Alexander searched his memory and searched again for any clue to the meaning that underlay Amaliel's words. He found none and a sense of impending doom overtook him, 
far worse than the provision of frustration already weighing down his mind. And he said the words tolling like a brazen gong. Then do so. Let one person come forth from that crowd over there. It was done. They brought to him a beardless youth, slim, not tall, with light brown hair and the sallow skin of one of the ever-recurring sport lines humanity had generated. Amaliel gestured him to stand before the machine on which he rested one arm for support, for he was very old. Watch your supremacy. And it began, projected as it were within a cloud, feeling vast yet visibly limited to the few square yards of vacant ground before the imperial dais images. The brush parted. A man's head peered out, grizzled and gap-toothed, as he smiled in anticipation. Beside the head, a spear appeared, a crude thing with a point of stone and a shaft of hardened wood. Muscles bunched beneath a shawl of shaggy goat hide. The spear flew, a thing clad in stripes and armed with raking claws, spewed blood into the water of a forest pool. In a cave, hungry children tore gobbets of reeking flesh from its bone and stuffed them into their mouths. Their hands came to hold exquisite knives and forks of engraved silver. Their greasy, naked shoulders vanished beneath elegant coats of plum-colored velvet, while the roof reared up and turned to a carved ceiling across which an artist had painted, truth descending to the arts and sciences. Lolling in handsome oaken chairs around a walnut table, the company sipped wine from crystal goblets. Instruments of inlaid rosewood under their chins or poised before their lips. They answered the signal of the conductor and music rang out. In response to the frequency of the vibrations, dust organized itself into patterns on a tight-stretched membrane. And the scientist showed them to the mathematician who dipped his quill in a pot of ink and wrote quickly. Reading the fine leather-bound volume, the student paused and stared at the flame of his candle. It enlarged to shine so brilliantly he could not keep his eyes on it. He slid a piece of smoked glass across the eyepiece of his telescope and continued his observations, sketching the position of the strange dark blots which every now and then marred the bright disk of the sun. The sunlight poured down on the mountainside, Quarrying with a tiny shovel and a light hammer, the explorer revealed segments of folded sedimentary rock. One fold cracked apart, and bright metal glinted. The metallic sheen was everywhere, casting back the glow of the fluorescence in the ceiling. Quiet music came from a green box on a shelf, connected by a cable to a socket in the wall. Humming the melody, a man in a white coat tipped the contents of a glass vial into a jar. The mixture turned black. Black all around him, the pilot concentrated on the instruments. On a pillar of fire, the vessel settled to the surface of the new planet. The pilot tested the air and emerged to look about him. A creature with tentacles like whips crawled across the alien ground toward him. He waited till it had raised over him its reeking maw, then slashed it with a weapon mounted in the arm of his protective suit. Enough! Enough. The suit was of shiny metal, twelve feet tall. It was ultra-alloy. The voice that boomed from it made the heavens ring. The creature with the tentacles resisted the blast of the weapon, closing its arms tighter and tighter, flowing together to mend the gashes in its tissue. The jaws stretched and engulfed him, then clamped shut. There was darkness. Enough! Enough. Roared Alexander again, and tramped down from the imperial dais to confront Amaliel and the sallow youth, on whose face was a hint of petulance he dared not give voice to. Amalia, what What world world is that that you have been been showing me? No world you can reach. Your supremacy. Do you not wonder why the pilot of the spaceship failed to defeat the monster after all? And why at the end 
he bore so close a resemblance to your magnificent self? There was silence, during which the youth began to edge away out of reflex rather than any honest hope of escape if Alexander's rage extended to embrace him. Alexander stood quite still, however, while Amaliel went on. If it had been in keeping with what the records tell us of ancient custom, the purpose of this gathering would have been for you to proclaim yourself absolute ruler of the galaxy. I have just shown you a world you never knew existed, one where your attempt at intrusion resulted in your destruction. Eight hundred thousand years have not sufficed to gain you entry to that world. Then were you to endure a million times longer, you still would be barred from it. Your conquests, my lord, have been in vain. Alexander sought an exit from this dilemma and found none. He surveyed the packed billions of those whom he had brought together, and he contemplated destroying them, for with them would go the unattainable world. But what would that profit him? After so many millennia of victory, was he to concede defeat to those whom he so greatly despised by acknowledging his inability to live in the same universe with them? The paradox that he could only conquer if he abolished thus failed to enjoy what he had conquered, ate at the edges of his mind. Areas of knowledge blanked out one by one. His sense of purpose eroded. Vocabularies, histories, sciences disappeared into a catatonic limbo. Who am I? cried Alexander in the silent caverns of his ultra-alloy frame. And there was no answer. But he's stopped. He's dead, isn't he? Amaliel gave a solemn nod. What did you do to him? With the aid of this machine, which they have devised on Earth, I showed him a world he can never overrun. What world? It, it, it seemed familiar, and, and yet... It... I showed him... The imagination of a man. You've been listening to Mindwebs. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Joining me in the reading this time were Cliff Roberts, Kerry Frumpkin, Jim Fleming, and Rick Murphy. Technical production on this program by Leslie Hilsenhoff and Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is a production of WHA in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.